Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and Ramadan Kareem. This is Agahi with your host, Waris Zainab. And in this holy month of Ramadan, we are going to talk about um, the anxiety that is associated with fasting, especially for people living in the United Kingdom where the hours are really long and stressful living, day jobs, um, other commitments, school runs for mothers. And it can be a time of great anxiety for people for whom um, this may be the first time they're fasting or for people who have tons of responsibilities and uh, they kind of have to struggle between work life and also to maintain the balance that you're supposed to maintain during the month of fasting um, by taking out enough time for praying, for increasing your level of spirituality um, and emotional resilience. So let's welcome our guest for today. Today we have with us Sister Amin Amina, and she is an EFT practitioner. And um, I'll ask Amina to introduce herself and tell us about the amazing work that she does. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as salam. Jazakallah khair for having me here and this beautiful, warm invitation, mashallah. Uh, yeah, so my name is Amina Jane O'Rourke, and I'm an EFT practitioner and tapping therapist. And so obviously we've had a recent catch up, right, where we were discussing, you know, like the levels of anxiety and, you know, often sometimes the resentment that comes with this very, and that can sound so like sacrilegious, right, you know, to many of the viewers today will be like resentment, anxiety in Ramadan, subhanAllah. Mm -hmm. So I spend a lot of my professional time now um, supporting ladies who are dealing with anxiety in and outside of Ramadan okay so like my specialism is anxiety reduction anyway and so of and also in addition to that I have spent the last 10 years supporting converts and new Muslims where there's been a lot of first-time fasters yes. and you know the anxiety along with many other aspects of Ramadan have been quite the um the physical and spiritual um, shall we say shock yeah. <laughs> you know to you know, because it's first time right and the long fast in the UK as you you've mentioned there already here in the northern hemisphere subhanallah may Allah accept them all <laughs> so uh, yeah so I've spent a lot of time using EFT and other breath work tools to reduce significantly the anxiety that ladies live with every day and there's often, you know, very basic, easy to use self-help. Once you know it, you can implement it on a daily basis, kind of self-help techniques, if you like, to help reduce anxiety and such like that. So obviously a hot topic, like you've mentioned very recently, has been the anxiety in Ramadan. You know, yeah. what's good. And even the anxiety that comes with the people who are exempt from fasting, right? Because they feel like they're going to miss out, you know, regardless of whether they're a convert or, you know, a heritage or a born Muslim, whatever term you would like to use and I'm just all for making sure you know as many people around me as possible can really embrace this really special time yes. you know in however they're entering it physically emotionally mentally and spiritually we're hoping for a recharge right yeah that's the goal spiritual <laughs> so, upliftment yes yeah yeah definitely but um I think for most people um the main question is how do we create a balance because most people have say for example other commitments they've got full-time jobs and on top of that for example mothers who have school runs to do other commitments responsibilities around um, their families and households to take time out to practice self-compassion um, um, self-discipline how is that even possible Exactly. What a beautiful question that actually is, in all honesty, and what a harrowing one it is at the same time, right? Because I always say, you know, Muslim women are women uh, are women of many hats or hijabs, whichever, you know. Uh, we have a lot of roles and responsibilities, you know. It's not always a case of either being a stay-at-home mom, you know, or it's not always the case that you're out at work. Everybody's situation is different. And my number one piece of advice usually is, be aware of what's realistic for you, you know, and this, this whole journey, I'm sure you know this already, and many of our viewers will as well, is a personal best attempt before uh, we meet all day, right? Absolutely. And that doesn't matter what the next person is doing in reality. And I know it's hard to forget that. I know that in itself can cause some anxiety. But if you set goals that are realistic for you, 
you know what your responsibilities are and the only other you know like the only other one who knows outside of you who how big your responsibilities and how big the burden is or you know the responsibilities that you're carrying are is Allah and he knows what you're capable of and he only wants your best he doesn't want perfection I always say this you know like lots of us strive for that perfection right I think and the effort that you make and your pure intentions that what makes it worthwhile and like you said um Allah knows best. He knows what's in your heart. So it doesn't matter how small or big that first step that you have taken towards submission towards Allah or building that relationship between you and your creator. As long as, long as you're doing something, I think that's all that matters. Yeah. And for, for many people, the fast itself is a huge challenge. You know, so like people talk about all these like extensive khidma projects that they do and all this kind of stuff. And that's fabulous. Honestly, may I like it, but not everybody's capable of that. So, you know, it's, it's that classic example. And you'll be very familiar with this because of your own background where we're always com constantly comparing ourselves to other people, oh, yeah. you know, like, you know, and that's just it's kind of part of human nature but it's also a reminder for us not to do that as well because Allah made us all as individuals right so from an, on a practical level it's reminding ourselves that yeah wow mashallah she's doing great even with all her heavy load she's carrying she's doing fabulous she's doing more than me but that's okay it's okay for her to do more than me because Allah knows me and I know that I I would love to do that but I'm not maybe in that season of my life right now where that's you know available to me and I honestly believe you know like Allah puts us through these feelings so that we can empathize with others when we transition into a next phase of reality as a mother or a sister or a daughter or a grandmother what have you is that we can truly empathize with younger people then you know when they've got small children like you've said school runs and lots of you know responsibilities mm. and so we can be of that you know be ser of service in that way to them because we've not had that support that kind of thing you know it's a really beautiful lesson for us like oh I remember what I was like and then you've got capacity to serve and Allah knows that you're using a wisdom that he's taught you years ago how you coped with that you know that anxiety that was placed inside you yes. you embraced it with a personal best attempt knowing that you'd be able to you know run like along with like the super ramadan athlete spiritual athletes if you like you know instead of feeling like you're probably walking you know yes. alhamdulillah yes no that, that that's um a beautiful point that you mentioned that um everybody has their own capacity and um you know resources so it's not about focusing on the quantity but rather quality of what you're doing so even if you take just like 10 minutes or 20 minutes of reflecting on that ayah of the Quran, for example, instead of comparing yourself with your next door neighbor who has finished the whole Quran in just like 20 days and feeling guilty about that or feeling, oh, I didn't, um, you know, spend enough time this month in doing all the things and getting everything for, off from the checklist. I think it should be more, I should be focusing more on self uh, development and growth and emotional resilience. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, exactly that. And that's is something else I've said recently uh, in other spaces is even placing your hand over your heart and earthing yourself that way, reconnecting yourself by physically acknowledging that your lungs are still filling with air because Allah continues to do that for you, right? Is a gift. Our lives are measured in breaths. And too many of us don't breathe enough, <laughs> <laughs> right and this is why breath work is so good for people right so I always encourage people you know put your hand over your heart and feel the palm of your hand try and feel your heart beating and know that every cell in your body is reacting to Allah's reality even if you're not com completely conscious of it at the time and you know give yourself some love give yourself some compassion because the fast is hard sometimes and sometimes it's not the fast that's hard it's the other things that you know like it's the fatigue itself that's hard so you know don't forget that like you've just said somebody will finish the quran but if you spend three days on the one ayah and you're really deeply contemplating it or struggling to read it slowly in arabic because you're not a native arabic speaker or reader there's so much it's, it's it's that whole penny or a penny and a million pounds thing for sadaka right yes. <laughs> you know you have to remember that for yourself a letter mashallah 
because some people are really starting from a place where they already know they're not they know before they start they're not going to achieve what many people are talking about online and feel so disheartened and the goal of this conversation is don't lose hope in yourself yes. because yes. Allah gives you a lot more strength than you even feel like you have subhanallah and to hone in on that trust him trust him honestly subhanallah you you spoke about um anxiety associated with uh, fasting um and spirituality in general how some people um, question themselves, will I be able to do this? Will I be able to fast all all these days? Will I be able to finish the Quran? Um, you know, people set certain goals for themselves and expectations from themselves. And when they don't um, achieve that goal, then there is this um, feeling of anxiety and self-disappointment um, and you in indulge yourself in self-sabotaging behavior. How can you cope with that with that feeling one of the best pieces of advice best pieces of advice I was ever given about this from one of my teachers was each day you are allowed only a five minute pity party is what she used to say wow. she said, okay. have it but don't drink tea and coffee with it and don't invite it over for dinner that's, <laughs> that's brilliant yeah. advice so she's saying acknowledge that you know in terms of your own spiritual journey days often don't go the way that we'd have hoped on a regular day but especially in Ramadan that you know the month is so short and you know as quick as it's here it's gone again right and then we're like subhanallah how did that go so fast and I wanted to do this and I wanted to do that and I would say never give up trying but if you feel like you need to you know readjust your goals do that as well really do that as well because Allah is, you know, subhanAllah, the reward that we get, even for the difficulty, we can't even comprehend, isn't it? Right. So it's like we are so harsh on ourselves. If we could only, you know, fathom for a moment how incomprehensible Allah's love and mercy is for us, and especially during Ramadan, if we could just afford ourselves a little bit of that forgiveness. So have your pity party. And I don't mean that in a disrespectful way or a spiritually bypassing way, by the way. I'm saying that as in, you know, retreat, reflect and remember at the end of each day. OK, that didn't go the way I want. Was something I could have done differently there? And sometimes it's not you. It's other people around you. We all know that story, don't we? You, yeah, know, you, oh, can, yeah. you can only do the best you can with the tools you have in the situation that you're in. And remembering that, you know, and it all feeds back to that Allah wants your best, not perfection. Allah knows what your capacity is financially, physically, mentally, emotionally, you know, spiritually. He knows where you're at. And he also knows that it's written in your divine decree, you know, when those things are going to expand and when they're not. So we're often being too harsh with ourselves, mm. I think. Yes. And when we start to show ourselves a bit of acceptance for where we're at right now, that actually helps us expand a little bit in itself because it's like, I'm actually not as bad as I thought. <laughs> And that expansion allows for more room for positive growth, right? Yes. You know, so, well, in my in my professional and personal opinion, that's been what I found so far. So by meeting people exactly where they're at, regardless of whether they're a convert or a war Muslim, enables them to feel empowered enough to grow into whatever is next. And it's different for everybody. It really, really is. It's just like Allah is going to judge and reward each one of us differently. It's not like one formula for all, because like you said, we are all different. We are all unique. We all have like a different set of challenges that we face in our daily life. And as long as we have the pure intention of doing the best that we can with whatever is available, I think that's the, that's the main thing. That's the main goal. Um, Sorry, just to, just to add to that beautiful statement you've made there it is so true and sadly and this is like such a heartbreaking reality I've seen so many women over the years who feel like their difficulty is always translated as punishment from Allah oh, yes. oh. and I'm just like this let me oh and obviously we have to work on this because this is part of self-limiting belief system right and it's about limited exposure to you know comprehension of Allah's mercy as a child growing up I often like had heard another teacher say recently he said stop telling your five-year-old children about Jahannam 
Jahannam wasn't made for your five-year-old children. Jannah was made for your five-year-old children. <laughs> Stop threatening your children with Jahannam, you know, and Allah is going to be angry with them. Instead, tell them that Jannah was made for them to be with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I was just like, because it's true, right? It's true. It is. It is. We're, on, we're, kind, we're trying to guide our children, but the truth is, even making statements about Allah is watching you, like I don't use that with my children. I use Allah is taking special care of us. Remember this. And my son, my, my youngest son, he says, you can't play hide and seek from Al-Basir. That's what he says to me <laughs> in anything you do. And I'm sharing that because even young children, when you use very positive language about Allah with them, and you know this, mashallah, uh, it really does help transform even as they grow into adults, their perception of the reality of what Allah actually is yes. in terms of our existence. Yeah. And unfortunately, what we're having to do is spend time helping women understand you are a believing Muslim woman, mashallah. You know, even a little bit Allah, mashallah. You know, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even a little bit, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. Because even that, mashallah, is a beacon of light for where we need to work towards, right? And sorry, I sound, I feel like I sound a little bit preachy, but I'm really no, not at all, not at all. I mean, I to be honest, Tom, I mean, and I I can't agree more. Most of us, regardless of the fact what what part of the world um, you were born in, uh, how you were raised, but this is something we are kind of exposed to as a child. Fear, you know. Um, even our bedtime stories would be like about inculcating fear in the hearts of young minds that you must do this or there will be consequences or if you don't do this, you will be punished. So instead of putting fear in the minds of children from an early age and instead of encouraging them to have a, uh, the kind of relationship with the creator where the main focus should be love, compassion mercy kindness and don't focus too much on punishment like you said or uh, jahannam and you'll be thrown in the fire of hell maybe have that focus on the the element of mercy and compassion so that children learn to love their creator and build on that relationship and i think where there is pure unconditional love then you automatically don't want to do anything or say anything to offend the one that you love and that kind, that fear comes from love, not just punishment or threats. Absolutely. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I feel like standing up and giving you a standing ovation because it's so important because that's love out of respect and adoration exactly. and longing. Yeah. And that that's that's who we was, that's who we are supposed to be, right? Yeah. And it's nobody's fault. It's not about pointing the finger of blame, you know, and all this kind of stuff. It's about obviously, you know, some people will look for that. But the reality is we're dealing with what we've got, what we've actually got now. And we've got to work with that and we've got to work our way out of that. And for me, it's so heartbreaking that ladies often believe, you know, that Allah's mercy is not for me. I'm such a bad Muslim. I don't even do this and I don't even do that. And I didn't manage this and I didn't manage that. And I'm like, but you did manage this and you did manage that. And what about this that you told me about before? And when you start, because they can't see it, you can't see it yourself. Quite often that's the human condition anyway. And we shouldn't due to ostentation want to, you know, revel in that place too much. But in terms of building self-worth, this is kind of like the key, I feel. When we're nurturing children into practicing Ramadan, for example, it's not about aversion to punishment. It's about, mashallah, this time is coming. We don't know how many times we're going to get to enjoy this time. And we're going to make the most of it in the best way that we can you know and and I would say the same thing even if people have got newly practicing adult you know born Muslims in the, in the families and you know they might have been having a bit of a jahiliya time you know as they say you know and then they've decided to take an a step mm. we should practice to never be a barrier to that yeah. we hold we should be that unconditional invitation to Allah you know if we if we say we believe in him that's what we need to be because that's what Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was he was you know, that's the, it was the doorway to Allah. So the reason I'm mentioning that is because when we get women, it's so much harder to work 
at an adult level because you've got so much stacking of experiences that you have to often as you know in your uh, professional experience as well you have to ever so gently as a therapist funnel down where's the root cause of this and sometimes it's a flippant passive comment that an adult's made yes. and they've rooted their self-worth attached to that and you're thinking okay how do we help dislodge that so that you can understand actually I think actually- the most important thing to remember is that the doors of repentance are open all the time but specifically in this month the mercy the rahma like it it's it's thousand times more than you know other parts of the you know year so i think to make the most of that um to take benefit from that that okay maybe in the past we've done something i'm feeling guilty about or but we're all prone to sins and errors nobody is perfect but at least we're trying we're making that you know struggle on a daily basis and knowing that the doors of repentance are open and Allah wants to forgive you all you need to do is to sincerely apologize and ask for it you know um maybe if we could shift our focus on that and then make a pledge to ourselves to improve ourselves to take small realistic goals and start working from this month and to attain it by the next ramadan um that's kind of like a positive way of looking at things rather than just feeling sorry and like you said using um you know limited beliefs um and telling yourselves that i'm being punished for something that i've done and that's it <laughs> No, absolutely. Absolutely. And you've just touched there on something um, that I hadn't mentioned yet, which was even if day one doesn't go right, don't give up on day two. If day two doesn't go right, don't give up on day three. You know, like every single next breath literally is a new chance. If the morning starts bad, it doesn't mean the day is going to end bad. And even though this sounds like, oh, it's all very positive affirmations. Sometimes we have a super bad day. Honor it. honor the feelings that you're feeling inside and outside of your body you know the emotions that are overspilling and acknowledge them you might need some support with them that's okay there's no embarrassment or shame about that there was people going to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam for support there was people going to certain companions for certain types of support so people seeking support is not a new it's just we, we're so out of touch with the concept we're just not humble enough you could say <laughs> you know like that initial community and even like me for example if i raised as an english girl would go to a house with my mum when i was small and my mother she would say i don't care if you're starving she didn't mean literally because she would yeah. usually for <laughs> just to, just to contextualize that i don't care if you're dying for a biscuit she would say you always say no thank you So you can imagine the culture shock food wise for me when people are literally piling <laughs> you know that come into a muslim house I was like oh, no thank you I'm absolutely fine and I might have been rich genuinely even as an adult super hungry but my mum had told me from a very young age quite harmlessly so out of what she perceived to be good adab as a guest to not accept these things yeah. became a very quick insult in the muslim community so oh, she's not eating any of our food yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, Yeah. with our food kind of thing. <laughs> especially in some cultures where hospitality is like another level you know um they go out of their way to cater for their for their guests and make them feel at home so yeah. i can imagine sorry i've digressed a little bit there but um yeah so it was just to circle back round to you know don't give up on yourself because as long as you've got breath in your body Allah is granting you a new chance and you like you mentioned so importantly every breath is a moment to apologize draw a line under it and move on you don't have to stay in that pity party you don't have it for more than 5 minutes so you could sit i mean some repentances will take longer than 5 minutes fair enough yeah. because it depends on what it is yeah. however when you've done your repentance forgive yourself for it as well because self forgiveness is short in the community as well Allah's forgiveness is up to him and that will enable you then to positively move forward and draw a line under it inshallah to the next thing where you're trying to avoid and you might make the same mistake and again like you've said you just need to keep apologizing some people spent like some of the best scholars they were even drunkards before they became scholars scholars and we don't hear about this because this is not like the you know the the fluffy stuff that we want to hear about the you know our pious predecessors mashallah 
And and we hear about it. They were, they were addicted to alcohol and, you know, they had some really unhealthy habits. Mm. But they got out of it. Yes. Something happened and something broke that chain of, you know, that cycle of behavior, as we know, mm. and they managed to establish a life without it. And some people were almost at the end of the life when that happened. But what, you know, what a wonderful state to die in. You know, you've repented what could have been for a lifetime of sin. Yes. But don't give up on Allah's mercy because Allah's mercy is not short. <laughs> He's not short on mercy for us, mashallah. So mm-hmm. afford yourself some of that this blessed month. Set goals that are realistic for you according to your specific circumstances. Even if it hurts a little bit, say mashallah for the next girl who's managing to, you know, read the Quran cover to cover. She's managing to do the whole tarawiyah every single night and she's getting up and staying up from fajr time because she's not got kids or she's, you know, her situation's different. And, you know, ask Allah to create openings for you like that at another season in your life. And and we keep moving, right? Because we don't know when the, the last day is for us. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, the month of Ramadan can be a pretty lonely period for a lot of people a lot of people Mm. who are away from their families or maybe they have converted and now they don't have that kind of family support where they could sit down together for suhoor and iftar and enjoy a meal as a family they can't really do that i've seen people who often um, fall into depression and they suffer from a lot of anxiety just because of that Mm. what can people do to cope with those emotions, those feelings of loneliness, isolation? Well, <clears throat> it all depends on their individual set of circumstances again, and I suppose there's no one answer for everybody. I actually answered a question like this online to, today where a lady mentioned that her hus- she lives in another country to her family and her husband works every evening, so she opens fast every night on her own and her children are really small. So we kind of thrashed out a few different things. You know, it's a problem-solving exercise with any individual person according to their set of circumstances. Some of the things you can do is contact other people that you know in your time zone, you know, uh, and I say that because, like, I communicate daily with people in America and Canada and, you know, work on teams of people who are across numerous time zones and support converts who are across different time zones. So yeah. I couldn't do a virtual iftar event, for example, yeah. in the group that I'm an, ad- I'm an admin on yeah. because a lot of people are breaking, are opening the fast at different times, so it wouldn't work. But for the people in your time zone, if there are other people in the local community, like other mums who've got small children like you, they also can't get out and they'll have a virtual iftar with them. Like literally open the fast on Zoom together if you can't physically meet or invite them over one week at your house for an iftar. It's like bring a dish, everybody brings something and you all share together, you know, and you're in your own home. So you're quite comfortable to have, you know, a guest over with other children because you're used to having the children. It even once a week will make a massive difference. Awesome. And so, uh, one of the things that I've done before in Ramadan is um, served iftar twice a week to the convert and isolated community. Um, but it's often difficult to get volunteers, believe it or not, for that type of event. So we would have like in excess of 100 people, there'd be like five of us serving 100 people. Wow. You know, iftar and cleaning up. So I haven't done that for a couple of years because obviously I've got my own family commitments. Yeah. But people did used to say how it changed the whole landscape of their Ramadan so if you're in a position watching this for example and you're able to facilitate an iftar and invite people if you know of somebody who's embraced Islam or you know somebody whose family doesn't live here but they're not related to you invite them over anyway mashallah the rewards you are the beneficiary yeah (laughs) let's be honest (laughs) you know we know that sorry it it doesn't always have to be um somebody who follows the same faith as you do it could be a neighbor it could be a friend or a work colleague just just to enjoy a meal and you know um it doesn't have to be for just one specific reason but maybe an excuse to just get to know your neighbor for example or someone that you know that um doesn't have family or doesn't have the same support system that you do maybe just invite them over and maybe everybody can take turns that today you're going to invite this person, tomorrow you invite them. So nobody feels overwhelmed with the responsibility because everybody has, you know, commitments. And I know a lot of Islamic centers and mosques, they 
they serve um, iftar after the Maghrib Salah so that the whole community can come together, sit together, and enjoy a meal and experience the blessing together. And this was it. This is another piece of advice that I mentioned exactly what you said there. If, <clears throat> excuse me, if the local masjid accommodates small children, so people will say to me, I wonder which mosque is your favorite. And I always say, whichever one I can pray at and my children can play at. Mm. You know, that's always, a t- it's usually a, t- a two, it's a, it's a, a two effort um, affair type of thing. Because if I can't relax with the children in the masjid while I'm having something to eat at iftar time, it becomes challenging and stressful for a mum, right? And my children, that their youngest two children are six and seven. So they were just a year apart. So mm. obviously they had a very busy time there, you know, especially, you know, through iftars and, uh, you know, they weren't awake for sahurs. Is to mention to the women, if it's doable, you can stick the kids in the car and take them to the masjid with you. And they will stay with you most of the time. They're not going to wander off quite often. And you, just being in a room surrounded by the angels with people opening the fast. And, you know, there's so many rewards to be gained just from being sat there, even though it might not be the easiest thing. It might be easier to stay at home, but you benefit so much from going outside of your comfort zone, even with the children to the local mosque, as long as you feel like you're not being ushered into a corner with the children so to speak that makes sense what advice would you give to people who want to practice self-discipline during these blessed you know days of ramadan so that they can benefit from that for the rest of the year i always advise people even before ramadan to map out the 168 hours we all have in a week we all have that then we colour in the amount of hours that we usually sleep and then we count how many hours are left over and then we track for a couple of weeks. So it's a bit late for this Ramadan, but inshallah, it can be started this Ramadan and move over right into um, Shawal, you know, and we can start there. The reason I say this is this is a, this is a real beautiful practical journey to wellness, you know, for self-helpers who are not actively seeking any professional support of some kind. When you've got this timesheet and you actually track what you would usually do on a two week period, you start to see where your gaps are. And when you start to make a list, for example, of 100 dreams and 100 dreams might be I'd like to finish the Quran in six months because that's a challenge and some People will know, like, that would be a tall order for me to finish the Quran in six months in Arabic. That would be a challenge for me. Mm. Uh, But it's not one that I'm averse to, you know, setting myself because I am a slow Arabic reader uh, at the moment. May Allah increase me on that front. I mean, Um, and the reason why I mention that is because dreams don't have to be about Ferraris. They don't even have to be about Hajj. Hajj is definitely one I suggest that people have on there because even though it's expensive for a lot of us to do it it is one of our five pillars and should be there but also drinking a hot cup of tea while it's hot can be on your list of 100 dreams and obviously these things that's not going to work in ramadan obviously because (laughs) wouldn't you just love a hot cup of tea in the middle of the day however these things all contribute to your general wellness and when you've mapped out it sounds like hard work it's really not it's just like keeping a time diary for two weeks you see where your gaps are you can really start to live your passions that hobby you've been putting off that vicar that you wanted to start or that gathering online you wanted to attend that's just for mums with no children that day you know you can start to put these things in your diary and make time for you these are all things that pour into your personal self-care and spiritual cup so when we start to organize our time on that level, we start to realise we actually have a lot more time than we realise quite often. Even busy mums have more time than we realise because you'll know, I know you already know this, mashallah, 10, 15 minutes a day makes the world of a difference to a woman when it's just about her and what really serves her, right? And it helps to recharge her ongoing, doesn't it? You oh, know, so. Oh, um, I mean, uh, this, this makes me um, realise that Sometimes people ignore um, looking at the bigger picture of things. For example, the same issues which stop a person from reaching their full potential in terms of the quantity of acts of worship, for example, maybe there are same reason why they actually receive extra reward. For example, a mother who's looking after her children or family, doing all the household chores, I don't think she realizes that she's rewarded for everything that she's doing 
because it's not obligatory on her to cook or clean, but she's doing it out of love and compassion. Um, or taking care of children or family members, working long hours um, to earn halal living or to provide um, for the family, for a man, for example, or volunteering at the masjid rather than being part of the congregation or, you know, the Quran reading group. So people need to focus on things from a different perspective rather than just focusing on one thing that, oh, I didn't finish. The, the Quran or I didn't do this number of rakats or I didn't do this, maybe look at the bigger picture that even if you're making any contribution to your family, your community at large, you never know. Maybe Allah will look at that and reward you more than the person next to you who's doing, I don't know, maybe 50 rakats or reciting 20 ayats. We don't know. We don't know. And that's just the wonderful thing, right? It's so um, you've just reminded me of another conversation I had with my seven-year-old I'll tell you very quickly and he was lying in bed a couple of weeks ago and I'm doing the uh, the calls just before he sleeps and uh, he looked at me and uh, I said how do you think today went because we do the reflections obviously of the day you know what was good what didn't you like what do you think can be better next time and he said Oh, well, I think I've had better days. And I said, would you like to win 10 good deeds before you go to sleep? And he said, 10? I don't think I've got energy for 10. <laughs> I said, okay. I said, try this. And he looked at me and I said, Allahumma, salli ala, Sayyidina Muhammad, <laughs> wal alihi wa sahbihi wa salam. And he said, how many is that? And I said, that's 10 good deeds saying that one time. Okay. And he said, I'm going to get a hundred good deeds before I fall asleep. Okay. And mashallah, I walked out of the room and all I could hear was, Allahumma, salli ala, sayyidi, mashallah. So the reason I mention this is because some people are depressed or anxious to the point they are paralyzed, as you know. If all you can do is the quls, if all you can do is qul huwa lau ahad, three times before you fall asleep, you know, whatever it is, Allah knows. <laughs> Allah knows. Do it. And do it and in honor it. That's all I could manage today. Alhamdulillah. And you know what the, the beautiful example you gave just now? You as a mother will be rewarded for teaching your child that. And when your child grows up and he teaches this to his children or other people, this is Sadaqah Jariya. So the reward doesn't end. It, it continues, and that's the beauty of our faith, that uh, you do one good deed and it multiplies, yeah. um, and it's like that ripple effect. Um, so, yeah. So it just very quickly follows on from what you were saying there. Before you know it, you can't keep track. You can't possibly keep track, you know, and it is highly likely the fact that you're conscious of Allah throughout your day, even a few times, because, you know, many of us don't have constant consciousness of Allah. May Allah make us like that. <laughs> I mean, but even the few reflections you have throughout your day inside your salah, outside of your salah, is your heart turning back to its creator? It's a praiseworthy, you know, rewardable state to be in. And because of that, like you say, absolutely everything you do, you know, I, uh, this is the thing, right? So, I say to the children every morning, they have a to-do list uh, before the day kicks off properly. And I'm sorry I keep mentioning these stories about the children. No, I'm it's just glad. Yeah, I'm sure people can relate, you know. I say, let's just make a quick du'a. Oh Allah, make all my intentions today be good and only for you. And that then obviously permeates into the intention of every act you do that day. So we do this first thing in the morning. I was only taught this like a few months ago as an adult. <laughs> so I was like how do you keep making intention for absolutely every single thing you do you know like what about all the stuff you forget about and the teacher said you make the intention in the morning at Fajr Allah and that's your intention for the day I was like mashallah <laughs> doesn't that make everything a lot easier and um, that in itself is just a, a beautiful reminder that you can't possibly count all the good things you do every door you hold open every time you give way on the road every time you don't act out in the car when somebody cuts you up type of thing you know so may Allah reward and accept everything from all of you whatever that may be yeah. and I honestly mean that and let's, no not make, let's not make unfair comparisons either 
just be kind to ourselves and show some compassion and kindness towards our own self before we can show compassion to others. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's definitely something I've heard recently a lot online. Treat yourself how you treat other people in the sense that be the kind of service person you are to others, be that person to yourself as well. Yeah. And I, I thought that's brilliant. I like that because it's so true. Yeah. It really is so true. Because often we neglect ourselves in the process and then we feel emotional burnout. <laughs> No, it's true. It's absolutely true. We end up not even on our own to-do list most of the time. Um, But, you know, mashallah, you've had lots of amazing guests on this show before. Uh, I know I'm not going to be the last guest you have here. Hopefully some things that we've talked about have been helpful, inshallah, to people. And, you know, this is part of a growing movement of people who are ready after a lot of emotional fatigue, I think where they've been trying to establish a fusion of identities and we're starting to arrive at a global Muslim identity, but not a monoculture, so to speak, but rather a beautiful fusion of multiculturalism, of lots of different types of Muslims. We are one and we've all got our own nuances and being able to unconditionally accept and celebrate each other and praise each other and pick each other up and push each other up and not stop stop pushing each other up you know because we 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 never should get tired of that one of my teachers says somebody said to her once oh you look so tired and she said alhamdulillah i should think so shouldn't we all and what she means by that obviously she's a scholar she's a woman of high spiritual resilience i'm not suggesting everybody should look tired but the funny thing is that somebody's passed a comment to her, probably with the intention of a, a different effect. And she's thinking, Alhamdulillah, I'm doing something right if I look tired. So it's all about how I receive that information. Yeah. Right. And you know that because of the work that you do and the training you've had, mashallah. It's about how we receive that. And nothing's more important than, like you've mentioned so many times beautifully, that relationship with Allah. Mm. And that's what's going to recharge us. So. I think May Ramadan, is all divine. So, yeah. yeah, Ramadan, I think, is all about doing and being one's personal best and being sincere with ourselves and most importantly with Allah because he knows what's what's in the heart, right? We don't have to worry about pleasing anyone. We don't have to set unrealistic goals for ourselves. It's just, like you said, um, little things that go like a long way and... No two days have to be the same. So No. And consistency in the small things is where, you know, a lot of success truly lies. Honestly, it is. Because lots of people get spiritual, that that kind of like spiritual and emotional burnout, like you've mentioned, Mm -hmm. because they all go no quit thousand miles an hour and it's unsustainable quite often unless it's done in a phased fashion, so to speak, you know, and implemented in that way. So, you know. And these are all lessons, even if that's you, you know, watching this, you know, episode, if that's you. Alhamdulillah, lots of people have been through burnout and they come out the other side, mashallah, and they needed the burnout to learn what was wrong with what they were doing in the first place. It's all, I I call it character and soul building for the sake of Allah, right? (laughs) That's what it is. Yeah. Um, I know you um, do a lot of sessions with um, with, um, sisters who may be experiencing emotional distress or psychological um, difficulty of some sort and they want to kind of find themselves in the process but also focus on healing at the same time and when we talk about emotional pain or pain of any sort um, people often out of desperation look for different sources of for relief and as an EFT therapist um, first of all if you could please tell us what EFT is because I know a lot of viewers may not be familiar and how that can help with dealing with emotional pain. Okay, so EFT stands for Emotional Freedom Techniques, and it's a really beautiful blend, to be honest with you, between stimulating the acupressure points according to Chinese medicine, like acupuncture, but with no needles. So it's like emotional acupuncture with no needles, except we've developed... um, the talking therapy, there is a talking therapies element to it. However, it's not structured the same as 
uh, what's commonly known as talking therapy. So a lot of the questions are very similar to uh, I've been told like CBT therapists. So it's very gentle questioning. So ladies will come, like you say, for a variety of reasons. Like some ladies will come and say, I just can't sleep. Mm. I don't know what's wrong. You know, I lie down at night and I've got a thousand things going through my mind about what I need to do. Da, 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 da. And actually, often the cause, as you probably know, what is that, mashallah, is uh, the cause for insomnia quite often is anxiety. And anxiety is, a, you know, a symptom usually of a lived experience at some point that's caused you to go into fight, freeze or flight at some point. And it's the brain's muscle memory and go to for survival. It's that whole bears in the room or lions in the room, except there's not usually a lion or a bear in the room. There usually wasn't in the first place either, but it felt like your body had to survive. And so my job really with these ladies, whatever it may be, and mashallah, these the kind of ladies, for example, that come and see me uh, range from barristers to NHS doctors to private doctors in the US. Um, there are consultants in the NHS that recommend my service to their NHS patients because they've seen the benefits. So alhamdulillah, there's a whole variety of different people from different backgrounds and housewives, mashallah, they can be some, amongst some of the most stressed ladies that I come across because I always say they're like the CEO of the family yeah. <laughs> quite often, right? And that is not a small task yeah. and it's an unpaid one quite yeah. often, right? Yeah. So, you know... Th- There is no anxiety or trauma too small and there is, you know, none too big. So what we do with that is we use neutral balancing statements to accept things as they are. And we stimulate these pressure points. So I will show the routine of tapping the pressure points to the to the lady. She will follow quite often, usually these days on the other end of Zoom or in person and face to face. And I will ask her a controlled set of questions around what it is that's actually bothering her. And she discusses that with me while we tap. And I watch her body language very carefully, a lot like some of the work that you've done before. And then we, you know, very carefully and very gently pinpoint some of the things that might be causing her some discomfort to help dislodge the root cause of what the anxiety is. Quite often ladies will come in saying I can't sleep and three months later they'll contact me after a session or two and they'll say, you know, not only am I sleeping through the night, I've lost 10 kilos. Wow. And I'll say, wow, and we never spoke about food once. And they'll say, I <laughs> oh, we don't, wait, yeah. yeah, we don't realize that anxiety plays a big part in our eating habits, spending habits, you know, viewing habits, you know, avoidance behaviors. So, you know, I'm that kind of person that helps the ladies get clarity around why they might be doing what they're doing and what we can do to help them realign with what they would like to be doing, what they feel like they were made to do instead. Amazing. I mean, you said just a few sessions could make such a big difference in someone's life. Mm. Yeah, I mean, everybody's different. Some ladies come for one session. I know I did one for a lady who's a CBT therapist and she had a phobia. And we spent 45 minutes together and the phobia was pretty much dissipated. And she could, I did it for demonstration purposes at the time to show her. So she was confident in the service that I was offering. Um, and she said, this is just incredible. She said, I didn't even know about this, you know, and she's been a therapist for years. She's a CBT psychotherapist. <laughs> and that's 40 minutes with her. But then some people will spend 24 sessions with me and they're really working through really significant traumas. It really is and I know you're not a stranger to, you know, traumatic conversations, abusive conversations. I always go as fast as the client wants to go mm-hmm. without rushing. So the goal is to not have a codependent relationship therapeutically, mm. to empower them with practical skills that you can use every single day. And so that they can, you know, look back on these very unpleasant life experiences quite often with more of a, like they're doing a movie review on it rather than living in the trauma of it and the trauma response of it, you know, which usually results in anxiety of some kind quite often. So, you know, it really does depend what they come for, how many sessions, you know, I've had ladies who suffer with, um, I don't know whether, uh, well, this is a healing show, so I think you'll be okay with me sharing this. I've yeah. had ladies who suffer with a condition called vaginismus yes. due to traumatic sexual experiences. Yes. And they've gone on to have successful smear tests after doing EFT with me after like six to 12 sessions. And, you know, obviously we're working through a lot of narrative there. We're working, you know, a lot of preemptive narratives that's usually, you know, innocently or unintendedly so 
presented to our young ladies to the point where they're super anxious by the time it comes to consummating marriage and unable to do so because of their anxiety so obviously we don't want that mm-hmm. we want to enjoy the halal aspects of life and uh yeah so everybody's different it depends what they come for and mashallah allah has given us these tools to be able to serve the ummah in a very diverse way alhamdulillah subhanallah i mean this work sounds a- absolutely fantastic um it look, looks like eft can be used to help people with a multiple range of problems and inshallah we can talk about this more uh, when we have you again as a guest inshallah but thank you so much um amina for taking the time out especially in this um, blessed month and um, may allah reward you for the great work that you're doing and for all the viewers who are watching this show if you have any questions for amina if you have anything to share any comments feedback please do so um by calling in our studio or you can leave your comments on our facebook and um youtube channel any final words of wisdom amina I think you've shared many already if I'm being completely honest with you you know it's been a delightful conversation because these conversations as I've always uh, maintained you know I suppose what brought us together I'll highlight that many people say to me how did you get this calm and I often remind them it takes a lot of storm for people oh, to yeah. get to a place of calm and it's often that the storm doesn't finish completely and it doesn't matter how slow you walk through it it doesn't matter if you feel like you're almost stopping as long as you're moving a tiny little bit just keep going even if it's a millimeter allah knows about you and that millimeter and one day at some point you'll look back and you'll think whoa wow yes and i'm saying that as somebody who suffered with anxiety myself and that's how I ended up discovering EFT but that's a conversation for another day exactly. you know but, you know nobody's immune to this type of thing and I am grateful to Allah for the anxiety that I suffered because it led me to you know they say the difficult roads lead to beautiful places oh, and yes. I would not be doing what I'm doing now had right. I not been through that experience alhamdulillah <laughs> rabbil alamin and I think major major transformations in life happens after you have experienced some kind of pain or trauma and like you said um about the storm i think there are two kinds of storm one that comes into your life to kind of disrupt or destroy everything and then you have the other kind of storm that only comes to clear your path from the yeah. debris that is blocking your you know blocking you from reaching your actual goal or destination so jazakum allah khairan amina for the those beautiful you know um um tips that you shared with us um inshallah we look forward to having you again and to all our viewers i'll join you again next saturday with another guest and a topic around your well-being and mental health till then look after yourselves and remember our team and your duas assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh